Good day, Grade 10. Welcome to this next installment of Physical Science brought to you by Tunable.org. Um, I would again like to encourage you that you join the platform, that you sign into the platform, and that you join our Grade 10 Physical Science class. Please understand there's no requirements for you to do anything. It's all there for your benefit and it's all for Free. The reason I would like you to join the Physical Science Grade 10 class is because then you could message me, which would be great, because then you can tell me sections that you are struggling on and I can focus my lessons on that. Or what would also be nice is that if you're part of the class and the actual registered class, then I can give you some online quizzes that you can participate in. And that'll also give me an indication of whether or not you're understanding what I'm teaching you. Right, so in the last lesson, we started off with matter material and I was doing some revision of that. So we're going to start with, carry on with matter material and then move on to other stuff afterwards. Okay, so we got as far as talking about electrical conductors. Electrical conductors are substances that conduct electricity well. And remember that I said to you, if you're with me on, I think it was Tuesday, yes. Metals are good examples of electrical conductors and the reason is because of this very important, very, very important concept, which is a sea of delocalized electrons. And if you remember, I said to you that if I gave you a hint, any hint at all, when it came to people asking you how you would be able to explain that metals are good electrical conductors and good thermal conductors, you have to say C of delocalized electrons. If you say that somewhere in your answer, guaranteed you will get marks. Okay, you might not get all the marks if you don't explain it properly, but you'll get marks. Okay, and I'm pretty sure, that, well in fact I did because this is a drawing, I explained to you how because all the atoms in a piece of metal are at the same energy level. All these energy shells are at the same energy level, which means the electrons at any point can choose not just continue going around their own atom, but if it looks like there's an absence of electrons on, for example, this atom, the electron could come along and at this point here could choose to to go around that atom instead of keep on going around this, okay? Just to give you a difference, a little bit of a difference, if you had to look at a covalent structure or even an ionic structure that is in the solid, what would happen is there would be a gap. So what happens is you have this gap between the atoms. So for an electron to travel across from this atom to that atom, it actually has to jump. It has to have huge amounts of energy. And that is why it is not that easy for atoms to be, for electrons to be conducted in covalent, or should I say in non-conductors, okay, in substances that are not metals. In other words, substances that don't have their orbitals right next to each other overlapping. These atoms don't have overlapping atoms. Um, orbitals. In fact, what you need to understand is that this space here, these lines that we draw, don't actually exist. They just say that this atom here is hovering in space in a place so that if I had to draw it, I could draw these lines here so that it looks like that there's a crystalline shape, but in fact it's not. These atoms are just hovering in space and in fact they're vibrating on the spot, but there is a gap between them. Whereas over here, okay, the atoms are closely packed and these orbitals actually overlap. If I had to draw that big, if I had to go there, there'd be this one atom of, say, for example, magnesium and this other atom of magnesium. And this is where the orbitals overlap. And remember what I said to you, an orbital is where you're most likely to find electrons. It isn't actually a solid space, okay? It is, an, think of it as where an airplane flies, okay? The airplanes fly along a specific route, but there's no actual streets up in the air, okay? So even though the airplane's going from Joburg to Cape Town along a specific path, okay, which could be, for example, the orbital where we are most likely to find the airplanes, okay, then they could deviate. So sometimes your electrons, okay, if this is your nucleus, sometimes your electrons could come really 
close to the nucleus and sometimes it could go very far away okay and it depends on the energy of that electron it depends on a whole bunch of other things but this orbital is where we're most likely to find the electron where they are the most stable. They are the first, just the right distance away from the nucleus to keep going around, okay? So now that there is that point there. And at that point, if this atom looks like it doesn't have electrons or is missing an electron, an electron from this atom, this first atom, could travel. Let me just change color. Wait. I'm really going to change color, I promise. It's going to travel along and it could come along at this point and it could go, oh, look, this dude is obviously missing an electron and I'm going to travel along here. And there are reasons as to why it would choose to do that and it's to do with energy, but you don't have to know that now. So that is why we have such easy conductivity of electrons. So some metals are better conductors than, electron, than others. For the good conductors are, for example, copper and silver. And we know copper is a very good conductor because of the fact that all our equipment, our computer wires, our telephone wires, everything is made up of copper wire because it's such a good conductor. Poorer conductors are your zinc, your chromium, and your nickel. And that's actually got to do with the fact that the atoms are slightly spaced apart and then the atoms also hold on to the electrons more tightly, but you don't need to worry about that. Insulators. Well, if conductors conduct electricity, then insulators do the opposite. Electrical insulators do not allow electricity to flow through them. They do not have free electrons. So non-metals make very good insulators. For example, glass, that there is sulfur powder, and obviously wood. Now, I know that someone is going to say to me, no, but if I have a piece of wood that's wet and I put a wire over here and I connect it to a battery and a wire over there and there might be a little light bulb over here, then the light bulb may shine if it's like a little LED. Yes, that is true, but that's got nothing to do with the wood. That's got to do with the liquid inside the xylem cells in the wood, okay? It's got nothing to do with the actual pieces of the wood, it's to do with the liquid. Right, semiconductors. Well, if you've got conductors which are very good at conducting electricity and you've got insulators which do not conduct electricity, then obviously semiconductors are substances that sometimes allow electricity to flow through them, okay? Metalloids are better conductors when heated. So your semiconductors, another name for them is your metalloids. And they are better conductors when heated. Metals, however, are poorer conductors when heated. And I'm going to explain this to you quickly. If, for example, you've got, and we're going to pretend this is an incredibly thin piece of metal, it's exactly one atom thick. Okay. It's basically impossible. Even with German engineering, there's an advert. Never mind. Okay, right. So, We've got one atom thick wire, okay? These atoms are next to each other. And as I've explained, the electrons can happily go along and they can go la 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 beautifully out, okay? Especially if we put a positive end of the battery over here and the negative end of the battery over there. Cool. However, if we heat it up, what happens to these particles? Remember that these atoms, even in the solid phase, they vibrate, right? But if we heat something up, heating something up makes it move faster. So what happens is that these atoms actually start moving and they start moving, well, they start moving more and they start moving more and more and more and more. So eventually what happens is that they end up being little gaps between the atoms, okay? Because these atoms are vibrating with bigger vibrations. So now what happens? What now what happens is that this electron that's sitting over here that wants to join onto that has to wait for these two to bounce together. And then this electron will be going around here and then it has to wait for these two to bounce together. And only when they bounce together and the electron's in the right place, could the electron move on to the next atom? Okay, so because of that, even though it doesn't seem like it, 
Metals, when heated, are poor conductors of electricity. They're poor conductors of electricity. So we don't like that. And that's actually why you guys have got fans on your computers because of that. We don't want our computers to get overheated because they do not run very well. Right, that's one of the reasons. Everyday uses. Okay, basically I'm just showing you that here yeah, you've got your little LEDs and what's cool about this is, and the reason I wanted to show you this, is because if you look at old fashioned traffic lights, you will see they just make a solid red, solid orange and solid green. In other words, there's one big light bulb behind them. Okay, similarly with older car models, the indicator switches and, and the headlights tend to be a solid light. Okay, and what that means is that, that if that bulb blows, there is no light. Whereas what's happening now, which is very cool, is that in the modern cars and in the modern traffic lights, they're using LEDs. They're using hundreds of these little, hang on, let me tell you what it is, light emitting. to produce lots of light. Okay. Also, is that every single one of them is independent of the other. So let's say, for example, you lose two of these. They, they burn out. It's not going to matter too much. You'll still be able to see that that is a red robot. Okay. Similarly, if it's in your car headlight or if it's in your indicators, you'll still be able to use the car's indicators and headlights even if one or two of the little LEDs have run out, okay, or have died. So that is a very good use of your LEDs. In fact, most of the torches these days that you get use LEDs and not normal light bulbs. So now let's talk about thermal conductors and insulators. We've been talking about electrical conductors and insulators. Now we're talking about thermal. Thermal is heat. So I've got a little video, but before we show you the video, let me tell you about stuff. First of all, some substances conduct heat better than others, okay? And metals are obviously good conductors of heat, and we've spoken about that, and it's because the electrons can freely move. So now, oh, sorry, let me just um, ignore that. I don't know how to do this. Oh, sorry, I pressed it twice. Let me go back here. So, this video here is basically showing you, I'll show you now. It's looking at the specific heat of metals. We have rods of different metals attached to a central hub. On each of the rods is a small amount of butter. The metal rods have different specific heats and will heat up at different rates. We will watch the order in which the butter melts. The aluminum melts first. The brass melts second. The iron melts third. The nickel melts fourth, the copper melts fifth, the stainless steel melts sixth. So basically from that you can basically from that you can see that different metals actually conduct electricity, I mean conduct heat. Uh, I just want to watch, show you it again and then don't talk over it. So what's actually happening is because you can see that the butter is melting faster at some points than others, and the reason for that is because some of the metals are actually conducting electricity faster. Okay, I mean conducting heat faster. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on with my words today. So what they've done is they've used a whole bunch of different metals and they put it on a central place and now they're heating it and there's a little bit of butter on every one of these, okay? And you can see here that your aluminium is your best conductor of heat at this, then brass, etc., etc. And you will also notice that if you had to look on table you wouldn't find brass because brass is an alloy. So this isn't a perfect experiment because ideally what you'd want is an experiment with only metals that you find on the periodic table. But in the meantime you will see that you've got aluminium is your best conductor of heat, then your 
iron, then nickel, then copper, and in between you've got brass and stainless steel. And if you think about it, this aluminium makes sense because if you go and try and shop for pots and pans to cook with, most of the pots and pans these days are made from this aluminium and that is because they are excellent conductors of heat. And obviously you want your food to get cooked with the least amount of heat from the stove, which means you want to have the least amount of electricity used from the stoves, which means you want the food to get hot as soon as possible, so you want a really good conductor of electricity. We used to use copper, copper pots are still being used a lot, okay, we don't use iron so much because it gives off toxic gases and ores, but anyway, so there you go. So aluminium, that's why your, your silver pots and pans are actually made from aluminium. Right, let's move on. Thermal insulators. If a substance does not conduct electricity, then obviously, I mean, conduct heat. Oh, must stop using the word electricity. If substances conduct, do not conduct heat, then they're called thermal insulators. Non-metals are good, conduct, good examples of thermal insulators. So, if you want to have a look at this, we're looking at thermal conductors and insulators. Your options are, you've got diamond, silver and copper, aluminium, steel, lead, ice, marble, glass, human tissue, all the way down to air. So amazingly, diamond does conduct heat, okay? And the reason it does is remember because it's made out of pure carbon. Then you've got your silver and your copper, your aluminium, all the way down to air, which we know is actually a pretty good, very good insulator. And in fact, if you're living in a very cold country, they have what is called double glazing on their windows, double glazing. And what that is, is actually a window. And in fact, if you've ever flown in the in a plane, you will see that they have that as well. There's a window with a piece of glass and there's a gap and there's another piece of glass. Okay, and that's sealed off. And the reason they do that is because the air is a very good insulator and this will be on the outside. Okay, and obviously this is on the inside. And what is happening is that the cold and the sound for that matter can't really travel very well between the glass here, the air and the glass here. So it forms a very, very, very good insulator of, of heat. Okay, keeps the cold out. You can also, some people put paper or cork in here, but air is actually the best insulator. Right, I've just said that. So our uses, like I said to you before, typical aluminum pots, pots. But please note that these handles here, even though they look like wood, they might be rubber. So they're either wood or rubber. And why? Because they are very good insulators. And why is that? Because we would actually be able to like to be able to hold the pot or lift up the lid to see how far the food is, okay, or to get the food out for that matter without burning ourselves. Whereas this pot, the aluminium pot, is going to get very, very, very hot. Okay, and this here is a flask that we use to keep our hot water hot if we want to. Um, transport some hot water to make coffee later or to take soup to school or something like that. So you can see here that they've actually used an insulation layer of a vacuum and a double glass shell. Okay, there is a rubber stopper, there is glass, but they've used double glass. They've also silver coated it, okay, and then they've used a casting which is made from iron, usually iron or aluminium. Used to be iron, but that's very heavy, so I don't know. Okay, so basically what they've done is they've used several layers to, to make sure that the this is insulated from the outside, so it can keep the heat in okay the double glass separated and there's a vacuum between the double glass so that is exactly like I said to you about the double glazing in the cold climates or in your airplane windows now let's talk about magnetic and non-magnetic material okay let me explain to you how magnets work okay if you look on the left hand side here 
that this is the atomic structure of non-magnetic materials. They have full shell electrons. In other words, they've got all the electrons that they need in their outer energy shell. However, the atomic structure of magnetic materials, this is magnetic materials, only have a half shell of electrons. They don't have a full shell. Okay. Now, what's interesting is the electrons line up and move around the protons and they create a magnetic field, okay? So, all atoms are like tiny bar magnets, okay? But what happens is the magnetic material, when it comes into contact with a the magnet, then these little atoms, which have been acting like tiny bars, they're called domains, and they all align themselves so that they all face basically either north or south, okay? Whereas the non-magnetic do not line up at all, okay? So a collection of magnetic atomic crystals form in a domain of magnetic fields. So basically what happens is your magnetic field affects the way these electrons around the nucleus line up and then when you put it together all of them line up in the same way and then we get what is called a temporary magnet. Now there's some material out there okay that actually they they're, no, they're not temporary, they stay in this alignment where all the little atoms are aligned along a specific way. And those are the things that we use to make magnets, okay? So magnetic material generally is iron, nickel, and cobalt. Not generally, those are the only three magnetic materials that we know of so far on the Earth's planet, okay? What you need to know as well is that we tend to define, just as much as we define batteries as having a positive and a negative side, magnets have a north and a south side, okay, a north and a south side. So, sorry, just let me go back a second. So, if you have to look at this, always, as f it's just by definition, the red is going to be the north and the blue is going to be the south okay so red is north and blue is south and remember that the same are going to repel so if i bring a south side next to south side they're going to repel but then if it's opposites will attract opposites will attract okay so if i bring the south side of a magnet near a north side, they are going to be attracted to it. Okay, so non-magnetic materials, we've got our trees again, zinc, okay, and then we've got books, right. Uses of magnets, well, the most important use in the sense that it's the very first one, one of the very first ones was to help us find the way around the planet because people realized that if they took a piece of magnetic material and they put it on for example um, some water so an example is if you've ever done anything with a scarf or anything like that you can take a needle or a pin but preferably a needle and you can magnetize it and then you can put it onto a thin layer of water like a little pond or paddle which isn't rippling and it will orientate itself towards what is called magnetic north magnetic north okay which is about 20 23 degrees to the side of true north but that's beside the point so one end of the needle is always going to point to north and obviously then the other end points to south and for that reason we can work out where we are and if you look at any map any geographical map there will be at the bottom a true north and a magnetic north sign. So you'll be able to use your compass to find out where you are with respect to the bearings on that map. Okay, they're also used for things like your speakers in your headphones or in your uh, on the amplifiers really of your hi-fi sets or whatever. And what happens is there is a coil that makes the magnet vibrate and the magnet is attached to a cone 
cone, honestly, literally a cone, which then vibrates. And as it vibrates, it makes sound. So if you want to imagine this as almost like a pedal of a drum, where every time the magnet is vibrated, it causes the pedal of the drum to go dush, dush, dush. And then that causes the cone to move, which then makes the sound. And if you guys have got some old fashioned speakers at home, go and ask your parents very nicely if you can go switch on the radio and then watch them. And you'll actually see them vibrate as the, as the music is played or as the person is speaking. And it really works exactly the same as an eardrum, exactly the same way, okay? And that as it moves up and down, it makes sound, very much like a drum. If I, every time I do that, that's the same as what the cone's doing, except that it's doing it different frequencies, but we'll talk about that when we do sound. Okay, yeah, okay, what, this is quite complicated for you guys at the moment, I'm not being rude, but this is an electrical motor. And we talk about electrical motors in grade 12, but we use batteries for the generation of power. So anytime we don't have electricity and someone says, oh, let's go and make, pull, put the generator on so that we can get some electricity, we are using magnets. And then magnets are used very much, again, very much in cars. So the motors in as well as the generators, okay, are used. In fact, generators and motors are inverses of each other. Okay, a generator generates electricity and a motor uses that electricity to make motion to move the cars. So that's what's happening there. Right, so that was matter and material and that was just a general overview of matter and material. Um, so that you guys can understand that later on when I talk about magnetic material or non-magnetic material, then you understand what I'm talking about. Now we're getting onto true grade 10 material. And we're going to be talking about states of matter, which is another word for phases. We can call these phases. And then we're going to move on to kinetic molecular theory. Okay, so let's do that. So I know that some of you may have read up and you may have thought, okay, there are not three states of matter. There isn't just solid, liquid, and gas. There is a thing called plasma. Okay. The thing is about plasma is it hasn't been around long enough to get into your curriculum and, and most textbooks. So it's still kind of in the experimental phase, not quite sure where to put it. So we're not going to discuss plasma. Okay, if you guys want to go Google it, that's awesome. Go for it. Okay, I'm very happy for you to do that. Um, but at the moment, it's still very much, um, uh, and it's not been actually identified as part of the curriculum, so we don't talk about it. We talk about the three definite states of matter, which are solid, liquid, and gas. So the pretty picture here, obviously, we've got is the solid ice, the liquid is water, and the gas would be actually a cloud. Okay, the clouds that we see in the sky are actually condensed water and water vapor. The structure, arrangement, and movement of the particles determines the state of the substance. So these, for example, are all made up of water molecules. And I think I've spoken to you about this before. They're all made up of little water molecules, oxygen with two hydrogens, right? All of them. But the way that they're arranged and how they're moving actually define whether they're in the solid, liquid, or gas state. So these are the properties of the three states and you need to know them. And it should be fairly easy for you to know them because you should have done this already before. Okay, so this should be a revision, but if it isn't, please study it. Okay, they tend to ask it a lot and you need to be able to identify it because you need to understand this to be able to explain things later with the kinetic molecular theory. Okay, so what you need to understand is that the solids, liquids, and gases are made up of a specific particle, like I said, like the water molecule. And all that's happening is that they're in different energy states. So if you want to think of it this way, I tend to explain it like this, that solids are like soldiers that are in their actual places and they're all one with arm width away from each other and they are marching on the spot, okay? The particles within a solid have got a very 
energy and they vibrate around a fixed point okay they are vibrating they sit in there and they're just vibrating they're not moving around at all okay and they're equidistant from each other okay and they're just vibrating there it says a very little space between the particles and they are very tightly packed okay I know that I've drawn it here, shown that there's space between it because there is space between the particles, but there's the least amount of space. The space that is left here is at the point where it's at its least, least point, okay? At least amount of energy to put it there, okay? It can't be closer because then they're going to start repelling each other. There are very strong forces of attraction between the particles, and that's what's holding these particles near each other, and they keep a fixed volume okay in other words it doesn't matter what i do okay you can't they're not going to take on another shape i'm not talking about if you hit it with a hammer and then you break it i mean as in that if for example you have a solid block of ice if that block of ice remains below the temperature at which it's going to melt it's going to remain that shape unless we go and attack it with an axe okay if we heat it up obviously it's going to start becoming a liquid and then its shape or its volume is going to change now liquid particles have got more energy than solids so they move freely okay so they're moving freely but they don't have huge amounts of energy okay there are larger spaces between the particles and there are weaker forces of attraction okay and the weaker forces of attraction are for the, because of the fact that they've got, now got enough energy to move further away from each other okay liquids can be poured and can take the shape of the container so in other words if you've got a container that looks like that if you fill it with a liquid then it's actually going to take the shape, okay? It's not going to go, oh, no, I'm not filling in that bit. It fills in the whole bit of the shape of the container. Right, and that is a liquid. Gases, very high particles. Think, I don't know, two-year-olds running around just after having a sugar fix, okay? They've got tons of energy and they're constantly moving. They, I've got take up large spaces because of high energy so they can fill a huge room they could with very weak force of attraction and can fill the entire container okay so think of this as also like little particles going ding 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 okay and they do all sorts of things and they bounce off the sides and everything else because they've got huge amounts of energy and they fill the whole container and you guys know this because if say for example someone I don't know, comes in eating some really nice smelling food and they come in the door, even if you're sitting at the back of the room, you will eventually smell that food. And the reason is because there are nice smells, okay, and the particles coming off that and you and they're being sent through the atmosphere as gas particles and then you will eventually smell that and you'll get hungry probably okay but that or if you want to think about this way if your teacher comes in and you think mm, she's smelling really nice you might be sitting at the back of the classroom and it's a perfume that's wafting through the large open space and why is it wafting through because gas particles have got huge amounts of energy with very weak forces of attraction right so those are your three states and you need to be able to explain the properties of the three states right let's move on so brownian motion brownian motion after amazingly mr brown okay was described for the first time many many years ago and what it is is it explains how gas particles move okay and also liquid to a smaller degree but many gas particles and it is defined as the random movement of microscopic particles suspended in liquid or gas caused by the collisions with molecules of the surrounding medium so what happened was that mr brown went along and he wanted to look at some gas under a microscope and he expected just to see these particles vibrating on the spot okay like the solids do or moving around slowly and what he saw was these particles going ding 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 dong whatever and for him think about it this way he 
couldn't understand why it would make such random motion until they realized it was because they were colliding with other particles that were also going crazy and going around and bumping into other particles, okay? And this was the whole point of them realizing that gas molecules and to a small extent liquid molecules have got huge amounts of energy and move randomly. Okay, so that is the definition of Brownian motion and Brownian movement and that's how gas particles move. Now the reason that's important is because diffusion is dependent on Brownian motion. Diffusion is the movement of particles and this is what I was talking about when I said you could smell someone's pizza or your teacher's perfume or something but diffusion is movement of particles from a region of high concentration to lower concentration. So high concentration, remember what I said to you about concentration. Concentration is, okay, concentration is very similar to density. Concentration is when you've got many parts per unit volume. Okay, and lower concentration is when we've got few parts per unit volume. Okay, so I want you to think of it, before I go and explain this to you now, I want you to think of it as an, if say for example you're mixing some of those juices that need to be mixed with water, okay, like for example ORAS, okay, and it tells you that you have to mix in a ratio of three to one, which means you need three parts water to one part ORAS, okay? Which means that in your glass, in your beaker, there needs to be one quarter of it has to be ORAS, and the other two thirds, okay, and the other three quarters has to be water. This has to be water. So that there would be a normal concentration, okay, normal concentration for your ORAS. And then you drink it and you go, hmm, that tastes good. What happens if by mistake you put in too much, you put in half of the ORAS and only half water, then we'd have what is called a high concentration. There'd be lots more. Or if we did a, say for example, you got a lot of ORAS, you're going to spread it thinner and you are going to rather just put in a teeny amount of ORAS. You think nobody's going to notice. You just put in a little bit of ORAS, a little bit of ORAS. Then you'll have what is called a low concentration, a little bit of the ORAS in a huge amount of water. And that'll taste terrible, trust me. Okay, so what is happening here is they've taken some water and have placed a high concentration of ink into that water over there. Okay, and then what happens is it spreads from that point there where there is a high concentration, spreads through the water into, so that eventually it fills up the whole container. Okay, and how does it do it? It does it by Brownian motion. Every one of those little particles that are make up the ink are going to be zigzagging around the container until they get to the point when they have filled up the whole container and that is through Brownian motion. So if you had to do it in a particle point of view you'd say that yeah before diffusion you can see there is a very tight um, collection of your little red particles and not a tight collection of your orange particles and yeah you can see they are equally dispersed and that's because you've had the Brownian motion has caused diffusion. So this leads to an even distribution of particles throughout the gas or liquid. Now we're going to talk about temperature and phase changes. Temperature and phase changes. So phase changes occur when either we add or remove energy and it's usually in the form of heat. Sometimes we can add it in the form of kinetic energy, in other words we can stir it, but 90% of the time we can cause a phase change by heating something. So if you look over here you can see we've got solid, we've got liquid and we've got gas. So let's talk about our changes of phase. We've got ice, 
which is a solid. We've got water, which is a liquid, and we've got steam, which is a gas, okay? And we generally use our water as our basic example because it's nice and easy. Everybody knows about water, and it's got very, very obvious changes, okay? You've got when it goes from a solid to a liquid, which we call melting. Then we've got from a liquid to steam or gas, which is called evaporation. And then you've got the reverse. If we go from gas to liquid, it's called condensation. And from water to solid, it's called freezing. And you guys need to know these words, melting, evaporation, condensation, and freezing. So a solid goes to liquid, it's called melting. From liquid to gas, it's evaporating. From gas to liquid, it's condensation. And from a liquid to solid, is freezing. And you need to know every one of those terms. There is a special one where you go from a solid to a gas or vice versa. In other words, in other words we miss out the water phase and that is called sublimation. sublimation. And if you guys have ever heard or been to a concert or something where suddenly it'll look like there, there's smoke or steam coming out from the stage and they'll say, ooh, that is dry ice. That's what they talk, say there. They say, oh, it's dry ice. That is just a fancy word for solid carbon dioxide changing into solid. Sorry, let me rewrite that. CO2 solid changing into gas carbon dioxide. And the steam that you're seeing, this beautiful, pretty steam stuff, which actually actually taste, smells a bit icky if you've ever come across it, is actually the gas version of your carbon dioxide and it is called sublimation or dry ice. Well, dry ice is the name and the process is called sublimation. So the temperatures at which the phase changes occur have specific names. So if you go from solid to liquid, it's called the melting point. From a liquid to gas, it's called the boiling point. From gas to liquid, it's called the condensation point, okay? So if we're going from a liquid to gas, we call it the boiling point. If we're going from gas to liquid, it's called the condensation point, but please understand that those are actually the same temperature. From liquid to solid is a freezing point, but again, the melting point and freezing point have the same temperature, just different names depending on which way we're going. So we can tell what phase a substance is at a specific temperature depending on its melting and boiling points. So for example, we know that water at minus 10 degrees Celsius is solid because it is below the freezing point of 0 degrees Celsius, right? Then if water is heated at a, to 140 degrees, it will be in the gaseous phase. Or we'll be, and why? Because the boiling point is 100 degrees. Here is a special case. And the special case, you will see that there's water vapor above the water, there's solid ice, and there's liquid water. And that actually happens between 0 and minus 4 degrees because it actually takes a little bit of time to form these crystals. So during that time, Time, there will be liquid water, okay, between 0 degrees and minus 4 degrees. There will still be water in the liquid phase. There will be solid for ice, for men's crystals, and if the outer temperature is cold enough, then there will be water vapor, okay, in the, or which I say warm enough, there will be water vapor. Okay, grade 10, so that is as far as I'm going today. Okay, we'll move on, we'll carry on with um, states, uh, changes in state, or in other words, your phase changes and everything else, and the kinetic molecular theory tomorrow. Have a great day.